The first time I did a lumbar puncture on a patient suspected of having Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, I must have taken every precaution necessary to reduce my risk of exposure. It didn't matter to me that there had not been a single reported case of CJD transmission between a patient and a healthcare professional in the U.S. It didn't matter that I was more likely to get a needle stick while drawing blood from a patient with HIV. All that mattered was that this patient might have CJD and prions might be spilling all over my latex gloves. CJD is a scary thing, and I think it's reasonable for any healthcare provider to be nervous about caring for a patient who happens to develop it. Welcome back to Brainwaves, I'm Jim Siegler. Today on the show, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease and other transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. This episode was powered by Paul Hodge, a financial planner who works specifically with medical professionals. He has helped members of the Brainwaves podcast grow their wealth and manage risk. Learn more about how to secure your financial future at paul-hodge.com. As a brief historical note before we get going, the reason we call it Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease originates from some of the first historical descriptions. And if there's anything to remember in medicine, if you want to be memorialized for something, you've got to be the first person to describe it. In the early 1920s, a German physician by the name of Alphonse Maria Jacob described the first five cases of possible prion disease. And just a few years later, a similar case was described by Dr. Hans Gerhard Kreutzfeldt. For many subsequent years, the disease was titled Jacob disease, or the Jacob Kreutzfeldt by some. However, one expert has argued that an investigator by the name of Clarence J. Gibbs popularized the term Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease because it had a much greater semblance to that of Clarence's own initials. Dr. Michael Geschwind of UCSF and many others still continue to call it Jacob disease, or the Jacob Kreutzfeldt disease, because, if anything, two of the five cases described by Alphonse Jacob had clinical manifestations of a prion disease, whereas Hans Kreutzfeldt's case did not bear any resemblance to what we now recognize as prion disease. Out of respect for Alphonse Jacob and researchers like Geschwind, I'll be referring to the disorder as Jacob Kreutzfeldt disease, or JCD, throughout the show. For more information on the history of prion disease, the concept of, quote, slow viruses, and Stanley Prusner's seminal work that ultimately awarded him the Nobel Prize in 1997, I'd recommend the 2015 historical review by Zabel and Reed in Pathogens and Disease. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail on prions, or these proteinaceous infectious particles, as Stan Prusner called them. Suffice to say that we now know they are misfolded proteins capable of exponential post-translational misfolding. The misfolded infectious prion protein, denoted PRPSC, stands for scrapie, a neurodegenerative disease observed in goats and sheep for hundreds of years. Every human actually makes a prion protein, which we call PRPC, the C being for cellular, but this protein does not normally produce disease. When in its normal conformation, scientists believe this protein plays a critical role in the long-term potentiation of hippocampal neurons for memory consolidation, Purkinje cell function in the cerebellum, and many other extra neural processes. When misfolded, the prion protein causes other prion proteins to misfold in an exponential cascade that ultimately compromises these functions, producing the Jacob Kreutzfeldt disease. JCD occurs at a rate of 1 in a million per year, with 80 to 95% of cases being sporadic JCD, 10 to 15% being genetic, and fewer than 1% being acquired or variant. It is horrifying that the most common form of JCD, the sporadic version, occurs when the normally folded PRPC spontaneously converts to the PRPSC with its inexorable downstream consequences. Genetic causes of PRPSC are thought only to make the normal prion protein more capable of misfolding, either by impaired ubiquitination or other protein monitoring mechanisms. Sporadic prion diseases, like sporadic JCD and a related disorder called the variably protease-sensitive proteinopathy, are most commonly observed in patients in their 60s, and they carry a six-month life expectancy, although rare patients have survived more than a year after symptoms develop. The most common presenting symptoms and signs of a sporadic JCD are a change in behavior, followed by visual disturbances, an ataxic gait, Parkinsonism, and eventually myoclonus as the disease progresses. Before patients even reach clinical attention, the patient or family may have observed more nonspecific manifestations, things like fatigue, headache, dizziness, sleep disturbances, or other constitutional symptoms like unintended weight loss. Perhaps most importantly, as you know, sporadic JCD is one of the most important considerations in a differential diagnosis of a rapidly progressive dementia. Memory loss occurs in nearly half of all patients early in the course of the disease, 
and among other cognitive and cortical findings, it's a requirement for the clinical diagnosis of sporadic JCD. The diagnosis of sporadic JCD is confirmed pathologically, requiring either brain biopsy or autopsy. When a brain biopsy is necessary for the diagnosis, a neurosurgeon interested in doing the biopsy may be hard to come by. This is because of the special protocols required by facilities for the disposal of all the operative instruments after the biopsy in cases of suspected prion diseases. Because these proteins cannot be inactivated by the traditional denaturation methods and sterilization techniques, they will remain infectious despite routine cleansing. Interestingly, many hospitals lack special protocols for disinfection of instruments used in other procedures for these patients. What scares me most is that these prion proteins exist not only in the central nervous system, where their concentration is arguably the greatest, but also in the liver, in the skeletal muscle, the lymph nodes, the lung, and the spleen. It's even present in the urine of patients with variant JCD. That being said, the only iatrogenic cases of JCD have been acquired from the inoculation with CNS samples, things like growth hormone supplementation, 226 cases, dura mater grafts, 228 cases, corneal transplants, maybe three or four cases, and repeated use of medical instrumentation, two cases. What's probably most terrifying in these data is the latency from a dura mater graft to symptom development, which has been reported as a median of 12 years, so there may still be more cases of iatrogenic JCD to come. In one experiment, depth electrodes from a patient with JCD were sterilized using benzene and 70% alcohol and formaldehyde vapor. Then two years later, they were implanted into a chimpanzee who later developed the disease. To date, there have been no known cases of transmission using blood products or other transplanted organs, and definitely no cases from physical contact, none from airborne and none from droplet transmission between patients and providers. So standard hospital precautions are typically sufficient, unless the central nervous system is being accessed, either by brain biopsy or lumbar puncture. In the absence of tissue, the diagnosis can be suggested by other non-invasive modalities. Occasionally, EEG changes are identified in the workup of altered mental status. And although they may be misinterpreted as seizures, you'll see a 1 to 2 hertz periodic sharp wave complex, usually in the form of biphasic or triphasic waveforms, which we see in about 70% of cases with sporadic JCD. These electrographic features are distinct from the triphasic waves seen in toxic and metabolic encephalopathies which have a classic anterior to posterior lag. The EEG background in sporadic JCD is typically low and slow, meaning small amplitude waveforms of a low frequency. In addition to these periodic sharp wave complexes, you might also see occasional spikes and polyspikes, which can be confused for generalized periodic epileptiform discharges, periodic lateralized epileptiform discharges, or even a non-convulsive status epilepticus in patients who may be extremely altered. The more lateralizing electrographic discharges will eventually evolve into bilateral synchronous periodic sharp wave complexes as the disease progresses. Notably, these sharp wave complexes may correspond with the myoclonus that's clinically observed in these patients, but these events are not considered to represent seizure activity. And therefore, treatment with antiepileptics is not indicated in an attempt to suppress these features as it does not produce any clinically significant improvement and the risk of antiepileptics may only worsen the patient's condition. Compared to other diagnostic testing modalities, MRI offers a much greater sensitivity and specificity, more than 90% for both when there is restricted diffusion in the cortex or the deep gray nuclei. You can see a bright signal change on the flare sequence as well, but it's not as impressive as the DWI and ADC. The rare cases of JCD which lack these classic MRI findings are MM2 and VV2 subtypes of the sporadic JCD. As a quick tangent, there are six major polymorphisms of the prion gene, and they are named according to the amino acid at codon 129, M for methionine and V for valine, and according to the size of the prion protein, 1 for the larger prion with a more distal cleavage site, and 2 for the smaller protein with a more proximal cleavage site. So when I say the VV2 variant often presents with a rapidly progressive ataxia, you know I'm referencing a valine-valine polymorphism, resulting in an accumulation of smaller prion proteins. Okay, now back to the diagnostic features. Besides the MRI, which probably offers the least invasive and highest sensitivity and specificity, CSF testing for 1433 and tau antigens can also be performed. But you really don't need the CSF profile to make the diagnosis. More on this to come shortly. However, in the absence of characteristic MRI or EEG findings, you may do the spinal tap anyway. The total CSF protein is often only mildly elevated, less than 100 mg per deciliter or so, 
and, in rare cases, you may be confused by the presence of a few white blood cells or even oligoclonal bands. More importantly, the CSF is sent to the National Prion Disease Laboratory for detection of 1433, which is about 80-90% to 90 sensitive, and ranges from as low as 40% to 100% in specificity. Head-to-head -head studies comparing the utility of 1433 and tau have shown that the CSF tau carries a higher sensitivity and specificity for sporadic JCD, but truthfully, these and other markers like neuron-specific enolase and S100-beta are simply indicators of neuronal damage, and we've seen them elevated in stroke, in encephalitis, and in carcinomatous meningitis. A more novel assay, called real-time quaking-induced conversion, has been used to amplify prions in the CSF with a modest sensitivity of 80 to 90 percent, similar to that of 1433, but near 100% specificity because it's detecting the actual prions. This approach is still only used for research purposes, but one day we might see this order pop up in our electronic medical record system. All these things considered, and moving on to the diagnostic criteria, the World Health Organization, European MRI CJD Consortium, and investigators at the UCSF Memory Center have all proposed different diagnostic criteria for sporadic JCD, but I don't really have the stamina to differentiate these symptoms, and it would probably bore you unless you're an expert in transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. Suffice to say that each of these criteria are all basically the same. Each group has recognized that at least all of these four criteria must be met. First, a rapidly progressive dementia, usually less than two years in duration. Second, one of several major neurologic symptoms, features like myoclonus, extrapyramidal symptoms, cerebellar dysfunction, akinetic mutism, cortical visual disturbances, and so on. Third, diagnostic testing suggestive of JCD, usually DWI changes or flare, EEG features, or an elevated CSF1433 or tau protein. And fourth, an absence of other etiologies to explain the rapidly progressive dementia. Now, we've spent quite some time talking about sporadic JCD, but it's not the only prion disease out there. As I mentioned before, about 10 to 15% of all cases of JCD are familial and due to mutations in the prion protein PRP. And while we use the term familial to describe this JCD phenotype, 60% of cases are due to de novo germline mutations. Unlike sporadic JCD, the familial version presents between age 30 and 50 with significant ataxia and other motor manifestations. A thousand times less common than JCD, fatal familial insomnia and gerstmann straussler schenker syndrome are autosomal dominantly inherited prion diseases, also attributed to germline mutations in the PRP gene. Variant JCD is caused by the consumption of foods contaminated with prion proteins. Take, for instance, the mad cow outbreak in the UK in 1993 where 120,000 cattle were diagnosed with bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Because of this, the USDA now tests nearly 300,000 cattle at random every year in an attempt to monitor for outbreaks. Since 2012, there have been no new cases of this type of prion disease, and only 229 cases have been identified worldwide. Variant JCD is the only known animal-to-human transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, whereas several other prion diseases may affect animals but seem not to infect humans. For instance, the chronic wasting disease of American white-tailed deer we talked about in our Thanksgiving episode. Kuru, the last of the transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, was traditionally acquired from the cannibalistic rituals of the Foray people in Papua New Guinea. It's all but extinguished in the modern world, but cases intermittently appear given the incubation period of often 20 or more years before symptoms develop. And finally, before we conclude today, I just want to touch on some of the other considerations of rapidly progressive dementia. Recall that sporadic JCD is extremely rare, one case for every 1 million Americans per year. Other diagnoses you should consider in a patient with rapidly progressive dementia with a relatively unimpressive neuroimaging are conditions like Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, Hashimoto's encephalitis, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, and autoimmune or perineoplastic limbic encephalitides. Patients with extrapyramidal symptoms and cognitive decline may have an idiopathic, drug-induced, or vascular Parkinson's disease and other abnormal movements may make you think of Huntington's disease. Those with prominent ataxia should make you think of the spinocerebellar ataxia syndromes, drug-induced ataxia, the Miller-Fisher syndrome, metabolic disturbances, vitamin E deficiency, and perineoplastic cerebellar degeneration. In a patient with the cortical riveting pattern seen on diffusion-weighted imaging, you might think of a hyperaminemic encephalopathy, herpes encephalitis if the temporal lobes are involved, seizures, carbon monoxide poisoning, hypoglycemic encephalopathy, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, 
and mitochondrial disorders, but usually there may be other distinguishing features or history that lead you to these considerations. Restricted diffusion of the bilateral deep gray nuclei should also make you think of a venous thrombosis in the straight sinus, an artery of Percheron infarction, cyanide poisoning, Wernicke's encephalopathy, carbon monoxide or methanol toxicity, the viral encephalitides, and osmotic demyelination even more rarely. So there's a lot to think about when considering a prion disease, and not just these terrifying little proteins. The bottom line here is, get the history, get the imaging, and if you must get the tissue, ask the neurosurgeon very nicely. I'm Jim Siegler for Brainwaves, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Brainwaves today. If you like what you just heard, you can find more related material on the web at brainwaves.me or find us on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio. Feel free to contact us at bweditorialboard at gmail.com. Be sure to check out our iTunes archive for older episodes. This episode was produced by Jim Siegler. Music by Jazar. I'm Erica Mejia. Join us next time for another edition of Brainwaves. Brainwaves.